Welcome to ChemExam Explained, where the aim is chemistry clarity, exam mastery. In this video, we will be focusing on Cape Chemistry, Paper 2, Unit 1, Module 1, 2024. Let's go. 1A. Figure 1 shows the electron transitions which occur between the energy levels in the hydrogen spectrum. So let's examine that. We see we're going from the higher levels all the way down to N equal 1 energy level. Name the series of lines produced by these electron transitions. So we already know that when you go from a higher transition to N equal 2, that is a Bama series. Of course, that's a visible region of a spectrum. But this one is taking you from the higher transitions to N equal 1, and that is the Lyman series. And of course, you don't see any color for this one. So the series of lines produced by these electron transition is the Lyman series. One part B, draw diagrams, including the axes to show the shapes of the S and P orbitals. So the S orbital, of course, is spherical. So this is our S orbital. And as you can see, the axes were included, X, Y, and Z axis. Now these are your P orbitals. And of course, your P orbital is your dumbbell shape and they are degenerate. So they are all on the same energy level. So there are three of them. Now, what is different about them is the orientation, but they are of the same shape, the same size, and they're at the same energy level. So you could draw any one to show the P orbital, or you could draw them together like this. One part C. In methane, the carbon atom uses four electrons in hybridized orbitals to bond to four hydrogen atoms. What is meant by the term hybridization? Well, hybridization is the mixing of S and P orbitals to form molecular orbitals of equivalent energy levels, and we call that degenerate. And in this case, we're focusing mainly on sp3 or sp2 orbitals. In sp3 orbitals, we have one S orbital mixing with three P orbitals, and this takes place for alkanes. In the case of alkenes, you'd form sp2 molecular orbitals, where we have one S orbital mixing with two P orbitals and the other P orbital remaining unhybridized. And that would form your pi electrons. Let's go to part D. Benzene exhibits resonance structures. What is meant by resonance? Well, generally, resonance are Lewis structures that show different distribution of electrons. In the case of benzene, resonance is shown in the movement of the pi electrons in the ring structure. So you can see here, we have our electrons within the ring, and we have alternating double and single bonds, and we call these conjugation. So here we have a double bond, a single bond, double, single, double, single. So the resonance for this would be the same diagram, however, the distribution of the electrons in the ring would be different. So where we had double, it becomes single. And then where we had single, it becomes double. And so here we have now single, double, single, double, single, double. And these are resonance structures for benzene. E part one, state three criteria used in the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory to determine the shapes of molecules and ions. So one, electron pairs in the valence shell of atoms in a molecule repel each other in such a way that they feel minimum repulsion. Two, lone pairs to lone pair repulsion is greater than lone pairs to bond pairs repulsion of electrons. And three, lone pairs to bond pairs repulsion is greater than bond pair to bond pairs repulsion of electrons. And here I give you a simple example. Here water is one oxygen bonded to two hydrogen atoms. And we have, of course, our two lone pairs here. Of course, everybody should obey the octet rule apart from H. Its rule is two since it has only one electron originally. So to be stable, it bonds with another one. So we have two for H's, 
but oxygen must obey the octet rule so we have two four six eight electrons on the valence shell and here we have the bonding pair and here we have the lone pair so we're saying that lone pair lone pair repulsion is greater than lone pair to bond pair repulsion and lone pair bond pair is greater than bond pair to bond pair e part two use the criteria in e part one to determine the shape and the bond angle in the a beryllium chloride molecule so we know that beryllium has two electrons on its valence shell therefore it will bond with two chlorine covalently and this would give us a linear shape so the shape is linear why because the valence electrons don't want to be close to each other so if you do it like that the valence electrons would be too close to each other and they will repel and push away from each other to exert minimum repulsion and that gives us our shape of linear and of course when you have a linear shape the bond angle is 180. For our methyl anion CH3- the shape is trigonal pyramidal and the bond angle is 107 degrees. So as you can see here in the diagram carbon must obey the octet rule so we have two four six eight the lone pair makes eight electrons and of course we have our charge of negative one and this is our stereostructure there are three bonds so it is trigonal and of course it is in the shape of a pyramid so we say trigonal pyramidal is our shape and this lone pair will repel these three bonding pairs close together to give us a bond angle of 107 degrees this bond angle allows these electrons here to feel minimum repulsion Part F, potassium nitrate decomposes on heating as shown in the equation below. So here we have potassium nitrate in a solid state. It is heated, it decomposed to form potassium nitrite and oxygen. So a sample of potassium nitrate weighing 6.20 grams, that's our sample A, was partly decomposed on heating. The residue was dissolved in water and made up to 1 dm cube solution. Then 25 cm cube of the solution was pipetted into a conical flask and acidified with an equal volume of dilute sulfuric acid. The mixture was titrated with 0.02 moles per dm cube potassium permanganate or potassium manganate 7. The mixture was titrated with 0.02 moles per dm cube potassium manganate 7 solution and an average titer was found to be 27.50 cm3. 1. Calculate the number of moles of potassium manganate 7 used in the titration. Before I continue with answering the question, let us look at what is happening here. Remember that the potassium nitrate was decomposed partly. So what we have is a mixture of potassium nitrate residue along with the potassium nitrite that was formed. Now that mixture was placed in one dm cube volumetric flask and dissolved. And then 25 cm cube was removed from that stock solution and placed in a conical flask. That was then titrated with the potassium manganate 7. And of course, we can now move to the question. So in calculating the moles of the potassium magnet 7, we look here and we see where we have the molar concentration and we have the volume in cm cube, but that volume must be converted to dm cube. So we simply divide this value by a thousand. So the moles of the potassium Manganate 7 is equal to the concentration times the volume, that is 0 0.02 moles per dm cube, times the volume in dm cube of 0 0.0275. And that gives us our moles of 0 0.00055 moles, which converted to standard form is 5.5 .5 times 10 to the minus 4 moles. F part 2. Using the equation, 
and here we have our equation and, and of course this is an ionic equation where we have our oxidizing agent the magnet ion reacting with the nitrite ion and of course the solution was acidified and we form the mn2 plus ion so the magnet ion was reduced to mn2 plus and the nitrite ion was oxidized to nitrate ion plus water so we are to deduce the number of moles of the potassium nitrite in the tighter volume so if you look at this equation we see where the magnet ion to the nitrite ion is 2 to 5 and we know the moles of the magnet ion so 2 to 5 is really 2 over 5 equal the value we calculated for the magnet ion of 5.5 .5 times 10 to the minus 4 moles and of course you want to find the moles of the potassium nitrite or we could say the nitrite ion so what we'll do now is to make x the subject of the formula so x is equal to 5.5 .5 times 10 to the minus 4 times 5 divided by 2 and that gives us a value of 1.375 times 10 to the minus 3 moles and this is in 25 cm cube for part 3 we are required to calculate the number of moles of the potassium nitrate that was present in the residue from the decomposition of sample a so really what they're asking for is the amount of the potassium nitrate in 1000 cm cube or 1 dm cube in the volumetric flask so we simply say if 25 cm cube produces 1.375 times 10 to the minus 3 moles then how much moles would be present in 1000 cm cube again we make x the subject of the formula by saying 1000 cm cube times 1.375 times 10 to the minus 3 moles divided by 25 cm cube and that gives us our answer of 0 0.055 moles and that in standard form is 5.5 .5 times 10 to the minus 2 moles and that is in 1000 cm cube or 1 dm cube part 4 calculate the mass of potassium nitrate present in the residue from sample a now remember we just calculated the moles of the potassium nitrate which is 5.5 .5 times 10 to the minus 2 moles and we know the molar mass of the potassium nitrite is 85 gram per mole we got that by calculating the value from the potassium 39 plus 14 for nitrogen plus 2 times 16 for oxygen to give us our molar mass of 85 grams per mole now moles is equal to mass over molar mass and we want mass so mass is equal to moles times molar mass so the moles of 5.5 .5 times 10 to the minus 2 moles times the molar mass of 85 gram per mole gives us our mass of 4.68 grams now this is 4.68 grams of the potassium nitrate present in our volumetric flask part 5 using the equation for the decomposition of the potassium nitrate determine the mass of potassium nitrite formed if 6.20 grams of potassium nitrate were completely decomposed so what we need to do here is to calculate the moles first of the potassium nitrate all right so what we're going to do is use the mass of potassium nitrate and the molar mass of potassium nitrate to find the moles of potassium nitrate so that is 6.20 grams over the molar mass of 101 gram per mole to give us 0 0.0614 moles of potassium nitrate. We then use the equation and the mole ratio, which is 2 to 2, which in its simplest mole ratio is 1 to 1. So the mole ratio between potassium nitrate and potassium nitrate is 1 to 1. So the moles of the potassium nitrate is also 0 0.0614 moles now once we know the moles of potassium nitrite we can find the mass of potassium nitrite 
by simply multiplying the moles of, of the potassium nitrite by the molar mass of the potassium nitrite, which we knew already to be 85. So the moles is 0.0614 moles times the molar mass of 85 grams per mole. So the mass would be 5.22 grams. So if we completely decompose 6.20 grams of potassium nitrate, we would form 5.22 grams of the potassium nitrite. Using the results from F part 4 and 5, calculate the percentage of potassium nitrite formed. So the percentage of potassium nitrite formed is the mass that was calculated in part 4 divided by the mass calculated in part 5 times 100 to give us a percentage of 89.66%. Part 7. Outline the steps taken in the laboratory to prepare the 0.02 mole per dm cube potassium magnet 7 solution used for this titration. Now, what we need to do is to use the moles of the potassium magnet 7 and the molar mass to calculate the mass that we would need to measure out to add to our volumetric flask. So we know that the molar concentration is 0.02 mole per dm cube. So this is saying that we have 0.02 moles in one dm cube. So we can get the moles from that. And we can work out the molar mass by just adding the mass numbers of the elements. So that would be 39 for potassium, 55 for manganese, plus 4 times 16 and that will give us a molar mass of 158 grams per mole. Now that we know the moles and the molar mass, we simply multiply moles by molar mass to give us 3.16 grams of potassium manganate 7. So we can start the process by saying, accurately weigh out 3.16 grams of potassium manganate 7 solid using an electronic balance. You are then going to dissolve the potassium manganate 7 solid in water and then transfer the dissolved potassium manganate 7 to a 1 dm cube volumetric flask. You are then going to add water to fill the flask to the mark. Stop at the flask and shake. And that would be how we form the solution that we need for the titration. Uh, we could simply say that after we know the mass, we would wait, wait out on the analytical balance, and then of course, transfer it to a container like a beaker to ensure it is completely dissolved, after which we would then transfer it to a 1 dm cube volumetric flask. Once it is transferred to that flask, we would then add water, which is distilled water, to fill the flask to the mark, to the 1 dm cube mark. And shake to get a homogeneous solution. And that would explain this question. This is the end of Cape Chemistry, Unit 1, Module 1, 2024. Remember, to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell so that when new videos are uploaded, you will be notified. Thank you.